Well, all right, Bridgeway. What's happening? Hey, hey. Well, I'm really glad we get to spend this time together today to focus on Jesus, to kind of collectively get together and turn our eyes to him, really connect our hearts to one another as we listen to the word and hopefully hear God speak. Yeah? Well, thanks for letting me share the word. Uh, I know summertime is a time where, when a lot of families get a little bit of a shift in their schedule and uh, maybe a different pace of life. But Bridgeway, we, we really ramped things up over the summer for, for a number of our groups. I sent off a group of uh, middle school girls to our first summer getaway for our, our students. Over the next nine days, we're going to send 50 students away to focus on the Lord and really get connected with one another as they're trying to figure out how to follow Christ as a teenager. How cool is that? 50 of our students are going to do that over the next couple of days. <clears throat> so please be praying for them uh, that God would do something really significant. Uh, then yesterday, I spent time with our Leverage Ministry, which is the ministry designed for people who are about 18 to 29 years old, people who are trying to figure out, how do I follow Christ as a young adult? They are an amazing ministry, and they're, like, there's some fresh new life that has been breathed into them over the past couple of months. So if you're in that age range, 18 to 29, and you're trying to figure out what it means to follow Christ as a young adult, whether it's in college or entering the workforce or trying to make big decisions about life, the Leverage Ministry is worth checking out. They just did a really awesome two-day encounter experience where they were asking God for some guidance as to making big decisions and dealing with relationships. So get connected with Leverage if you're in that age group. Yeah, way to go, Leverage. Thanks for letting me join you for the day. So when I was preparing for my message today, it it really got me thinking about Jesus as the I am. We got this whole summer series where you're going to get, ch get a chance to hear from different pastors and ministers about these seven I am statements of Jesus, where he makes pretty solid public declarations about who he is and really why he's, why he's here. And so I was thinking about this and it got me thinking about an experience I had that I want to share with you. And I, I remembered how my brother, who was in the military, talked about how he and his, and his military brothers would tell stories about wartime. And after they would get together for a while, they would hang out, and then toward the end of the night, somebody would lean back in their chair, and they would just say, so there I was. And everybody would call back, there you were, right? Right? And then they would end up telling a story about being hunkered down in a foxhole somewhere, holding back the enemy, and it was a pretty epic story. Now, I've never done anything that heroic in my life, okay? But I'd love to share a story with you. So let's give this a try. So there I was. All right, okay. So you haven't been in the military. Okay, cool. Okay. All right, we'll do it one more time. So there I was. I was at 9,000 feet in the Rila mountain range in Bulgaria, uh, taking a group of about 12 high school students on a cultural exchange program where our students were partnered up with a group of 12 Bulgarian students. And all they told us before this adventure started was bring a backpack. But there we were, in the Rila mountain range, hiking up to a peak they call Malovitsa. And at the top of Malovitsa, as I was trying to look back and do a little bit of research to fill in some of the details that have kind of slipped my mind since then, this is what the, the, the internet and then the, the travel guides say about Malovitsa. It says, conquer the alpine pinnacle of the Malovitsa on a heroic hike in the Rila mountains. Now, I had done some hiking before in my life, but it was in Patapsco State Park. <laughs> a beautiful place, but it didn't prepare me for this. 9,000 feet in the air, and like, you really felt like you were up there. The scenes were amazing. Felt like Julie Andrews was gonna sound a music right around one of the corners. But it was awesome because I got to to lead a group of students through this cultural exchange experience where 
only like a few of the Bulgarians spoke much English. And, you know, our students don't learn Bulgarian in high school, so that was kind of uh, a loss. But we got a chance to spend a lot of time together, and we were at the top of this, this mountain, and we had just eaten lunch. But lunch for this group wasn't quite lunch for the American teenager that we are used to. It was maybe just like a little bit of food, like a half a little bit of bread, some pepperoni stick, and a little uh, bell pepper. <laughs> I was hungry. <laughs> I was really hungry. I might even non-dramatically say it was the hungriest I've ever been in my entire life. <laughs> I've never felt hunger like that. And we were only halfway through. It was like this 10-mile hike from mountain hut to mountain hut. They're called hijas. It was a really cool experience. So we would stay in one of these hijas and then pack everything into our backpack. And then we would travel from one of these mountain huts over the mountain peak to another mountain hut. And we were headed to the hija Ivan Vasov. And over every ridge, they kept assuring me that the location of the next meal is just over the next ridge. <laughs> and the hunger grew and the hunger grew. They said, no, 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 just over the next ridge. Just over the next ridge. And that's why the scene you're about to see turned out to be one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. It was almost like the skies opened up and the sunbeam came down right on the most beautiful Ivan Vasov hija I've ever seen in my life. There it is. My salvation my next meal, and we got to hike all the way through these plains out to what really was as remote as it looks like, this mountain hut. And there we sat in a lantern-lit, smoke-filled mountain hut at a table with a meal cooked by the most rugged mountain mama you have ever seen. <laughs> Hunger, right? Is there anything better than to have a huge meal when you're at the peak of your hunger? You've had, you've had that experience, right? And your hunger experience might have been different than mine. It might have been something more you know, legitimate, like you uh, were on really hard times in your life. And when you think back to those moments of hunger, it's actually this place of despair, really dark times in your life where you really weren't sure where your next meal would be, or maybe you were sacrificing your meal for somebody that you care about and your stomach was churning. Or maybe your, your reason was maybe a little bit more spiritual than mine, that you had been considering what it meant to follow Christ and, and rely on him only, and so you spent time fasting and maybe it was days without food so that you could ponder the deeper hunger we experience. Well, either legitimate or illegitimate hunger that maybe it was a little bit more contrived, the first bite is unforgettable, yeah? It's something we wait for, and it's hard to think about anything else until that's taken care of. And so, in times of hunger, we long for that fulfillment. We long for that satisfaction, and hunger reminds us of something. It reminds us that we cannot satisfy our deepest needs on our own. We're dependent on something or someone outside of ourselves to be added into our life to bring us true fulfillment. You know, we think about this on the physical side where we need food to come inside of our, our stomach so that we, we get filled. But you know, we have all these other wants and desires and things that we hunger for and things that we thirst for that we need something outside of us to quench, to fill us. And hung, even though maybe some of those other things, we can you know, push them off a little bit longer to say, ah, I don't need that. It's not like a need. Hunger is something where you can't live in a constant state of, of not eating. It's impossible to ignore. We know that we, here in this room, whether you're watching online, wherever you are, you're in a place like this because you're one of the people that probably is clued into the fact that we are hungry for something more than just food. You are hungry for something more than just food. 
Me too. And most of our lives revolve around this interaction with our pursuit of satisfying this hunger that's deep inside of us. We appease our wants, we feed our cravings, we indulge our fantasies, we pacify our unrest, we scratch our itch, we gratify our desires, we want our longings fulfilled. We've got this drive and these urges that we feel inside of us and every marketing company around the globe creates them and feeds them and then charges you for it. And once you get what they promised you, it never gives you what you really wanted. And you're left hungry. Have you ever been there? We got what we said we wanted, but it didn't give us what it promised. We live in this constant state of dissatisfaction where there's this compare and despair cycle that we go through, where we're constantly comparing ourselves to everybody else or the things that people expect of us, and we realize that whether we do or we don't match up to that, it leaves us in the state of despair because those expectations or those, those things that we are told to pursue were never designed to fully satisfy us at our deepest core. So we're hungry, and I'm hungry and you're hungry, and then Jesus, he comes on the scene and he says this, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the bread of life. I have come to satisfy your greatest needs. The lingering question that hunger leaves with us is, what will really satisfy me? How about you? What's really going to satisfy you? You've tried all those things. Are you still hungry? Only Jesus can satisfy our deepest hunger. And today we get to look at, I am the bread of life. This, This declaration that he makes about himself that is of mammoth proportion. But this is in the context of something even greater than just his statement, I'm the bread of life. This is in the context of the book of John. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to have different pastors and ministers get a chance to share about one of the seven sayings, you know, these I am statements of Christ. And each of them is found in the book of John. The book of John, the last of the four gospels. You know, each of the gospels was written to a different people group. So each of the Gospels kind of has a different intent or something that it really wants to communicate to the different audience that it was designed to reach. And the book of John was designed to communicate a very interesting message. He, he was the one that really wanted to lean in to talk about the divinity of Jesus. That Jesus is God. He's the son of God. He is, he is the divine one that we've been waiting for. And so John who wrote the book of John, right? He named the book after himself, a little narcissistic if you ask me. Um, He also calls himself the one who Jesus loves. Again, a little bit self-inflating, but that's okay. I'll let you pass on that, John. Maybe you did have a special relationship with Jesus. I get it. Um, At the very least, we know that John has some special insight into who Jesus is. And so we read his words and we hear his stories because we want to learn from this man who really loved and was loved by Jesus. And John is the same person who wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, other letters that are a little bit later on in the New Testament. He's the same John who wrote about the visions that God gave him about the end times, and we have all of those recorded in the book of Revelation. This is the same John. He's kind of an important, an important character as we really learn what it means to follow Christ and what it, what it is to be one of his. And John is a person who loved contrast. So even as you read all of his books, you'll, you'll see some similar themes that, that he's the person who talks a lot about light and darkness, belief and unbelief, life and death. He's one that really draws a clear line and says, where do you stand? Which side are you on? You have to make some decisions about who you are in in relationship to Jesus because it really matters. And we can say there's some gray areas, but when it comes down to it, are you his 
or are you not? And John is a person who really draws that out. A really cool thing about the book of John is that he actually tells us why he wrote the gospel of John. You know, there are a lot of people who wrote scripture where we have to do like some real good contextual study to try to really decipher what were they really getting at when they wrote this book. Let's try to put ourselves into their mindset. But John like lays it out for us, which is really great. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it says this. Jesus performed many other signs. That's an important word we'll talk about later. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Wow. See, he draws that line, right? Why did I write this book? To help you know, do you believe or do you not believe? So you can look at the signs, you can look at what Jesus did, and you can decide. Do you believe or do you not believe? And John lays it out for us. Nine of the 21 chapters of the book of John are spent on Jesus's last week of his life. Think about that. John wrote 21 chapters, and he spent almost half of it talking about one week of Jesus's life. It helps us understand what John really wants us to soak in, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus of Jesus and the final words he had to say to his people. But he does this in a way where he also sets us up with these two groupings of seven, all right? Two groupings of seven to take us through the whole book to really build up maybe what it was like to experience the disappointment when Jesus died and the, the thrill when he came back to life. Maybe, maybe these two groupings of seven were to help us to get into his mindset as he saw how Jesus lived and how he taught and what he really wanted to communicate. So these two groupings of seven. The first grouping of seven is the seven signs of the book of John. Now the seven signs of the book of John are these seven miracles that Jesus did that were more than just a miracle, even though that's kind of, (laughs) I feel bad saying that, right? But a miracle, it's not even quite the right word to describe it because it was a miracle with a message. It was something that Jesus did that had a greater meaning than the act in and of itself. And then we have over here another grouping of seven, the seven I am statements of Jesus. You know, Jesus wasn't the Muhammad Ali type character where he was, you know, very, had all the vibrato and and talked about himself all big and bad all the time. So when Jesus says something about himself, we better listen up because he really wants to communicate something through it. So we have these two groupings of seven that are going to walk us through the book of John. And there are only two of the signs that have a corresponding I am statement. We have when Jesus healed Lazarus, he raised him from the dead. And we have I am the resurrection and the life. And then we have this other pairing where Jesus miraculously feeds 5,000 people with five loaves, and two fish, where he does that. And then later on, we have this statement, I am the bread of life. So we get to, over the next couple of minutes, dive into this and read some scripture and ask God to speak to us about what he meant when he said, I am the bread of life. And really, the, the, the meaning behind the miracle of feeding of the 5,000. So we're in John chapter six today. So if you want to open up your Bibles, we're going to hang there for a while. You can flip back and forth to the different verses that we're going to get into. But John chapter six is a long one, so we won't read the whole thing. I'm kind of going to skip over some of the stuff that maybe you're a little bit more familiar with. If you've been around the church for any length of time, you're familiar with the feeding of the 5,000. And if you haven't been around the church for a while, maybe you've heard this story where Jesus takes five loaves and two fish and multiplies it among a group that's huge and everybody has enough to eat. And so Jesus does that amazing, that amazing miracle. And then he dodges the crowd. And he, at the end of doing the miracle, they want to lift him up and start like promoting him and make him make him a ruler and like really 
really elevate his position and he's, he's not going to have any part of that. And so what he does is after everybody goes to, goes to sleep and his disciples go out on a boat to the other side of the lake, he doesn't tell anybody where he's going and he walks on water because he's, well, Jesus. And he goes to the other side of the lake with his, his couple of disciples, not telling anybody where he's going. Well, the people who ate the bread and the fish didn't really get the message that Jesus was trying to communicate by leaving in the middle of the night, not taking a boat, and not telling anybody where he was going. They were going to, they were going to come find him, right? So they wanted to see him do another miracle. Yesterday, had, yesterday they had seen something unbelievable, and they had heard stories of things like this happening with their ancestors, but now they had just seen a man multiply bread and fish to feed a multitude. To them, he was a magician. And I get it. I, I'm not too proud to admit my, my YouTube fascination with David Blaine videos and the, the multiple minutes, hours I've spent looking at all these really awesome street magic videos where he does something unbelievable. And I don't know what's better, the, the magic or the people's reaction when he does it and they just fall out like crazy. Um, but I, I get it. When you see an awesome thing, you want them to do another trick. And really, that's all they were getting at, right? They had seen something do, seen Jesus do a miracle, but they just wanted another, they wanted another performance. They wanted another meal. So we get to read about this back and forth exchange that ends up happening when they find Jesus. They find him on the other side of the lake. And there's actually a really, I think, unique passage in Scripture where Jesus goes back and forth and I think exercises a ton of patience with these people as they're not getting the point as Jesus is trying to explain what, what he was doing and why he was doing it. Jesus' extraordinary patience with them. But we'll catch up with the story right when they find him. The people had just tracked down Jesus on the other side of the lake and they didn't get the message that he didn't want to be found or followed or he didn't really want them to just chase him around looking for another trick. And they, they find him. And you know what they say? It's like they ran into him at the grocery store, like even though they've been stalking him, right? And they're like, oh, rabbi, when did you get here? <laughs> like what? all 5,000 of you, you just happen to be in the same place as me, Right? Jesus shows he's not playing around and he drops some serious knowledge on them right away in verse 26. So this is where we're gonna pick up the story and we're just gonna kind of watch this back and forth interaction and maybe make a couple of notes along the way. So Jesus says in verse 26, as they're trying to act all cool, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves. You ate your fill of the loaves. He exposes their bad attempt at acting like they just ran into him. And he, he shows them that they're, they're there for the wrong reasons. He's like, if you were here for the right reasons, you would be asking about the sign, right? It's that miracle with a message. So let's, let's set that out as our first key word of this whole passage, the sign. It's God's provision in our lives. But it's not just his provision. God's provision in our lives is not an end in itself. It is a sign pointing to a deeper truth. God's provision in our lives is not an end in itself. It's a sign pointing, point, pointing toward a deeper truth. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you for him for on him, the God the Father has set his seal. See, he was trying to begin to draw the connection for them that the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 was with the intention to give them insight into their deeper spiritual hunger and how Jesus is there to satisfy even that. Already in the first couple of verses of this exchange, maybe you and I are finding a little bit of something to relate to in this. That when God provides for us and he supplies what we need, are we just happy to get 
the blessing and not ask, God, what do you want to show me through this? Maybe you and I are kind of similar to these, these people that, that got their fill of the five loaves and two fish, and maybe we're the same ones that are, that are more concerned with the blessing than we were really figuring out this meaning that maybe, maybe that provision is a sign to us. How long does it take you to ask God for another miracle after he comes through for you? This isn't meant to make you feel guilty. He loves providing for his children. But did you even take time to soak in why God said yes to you the last time? There's so many times where he works miracles and he does things in our lives as a sign to point to a deeper truth. And sometimes we're so concerned about just getting the thing, we thought that was going to fulfill us when he said, That's, that was never meant to fulfill you. It was to show you something deeper. I wonder if God says, the last time I came, for the, came through for you, did you miss what, that I was trying to send you a message? It was never about this transactional agreement where you wanted something and you asked me for it and I evaluated your situation on some unspoken criteria and determined whether or not to give it to you. And then if I do see fit to say yes and you get what you want, we all walk away feeling good about ourselves. Great. And your prayer life and mine is this constant transactional cycle of ask and answer and left feeling like, what's next? It was never about the transaction. That was never the point. It was never about some, uh, some cosmic equation. It's always been about Jesus' desire to be close to us. See, it's this relationship that he wants us to draw, to, wants to draw us into to show us that if he can take care of this physical realm over here, this world, just imagine what he can do for the deepest longings of the heart. If he can take care of feeding you some bread, imagine what he can do with that unfulfillment that exists in the pit of your stomach that constant state of dissatisfaction that we fall into. He says, I know you. I know what you're really hungry for. He says, I know you. I know what you're really hungry for. Are we listening to that part of the message? Or are we just so happy we got our fill, we just want him to do another trick? You say, I want that Promotion. I want to be married. I want to have a child. I want a job. I want to get healed. I want to get out of here. I want to have sex. I want to impress my friends. I want my father to respect me. I want to pass this test. We've got all these wants and desires. And no matter how deep we think we're going with those wants and desires, they're so far on the surface. And Jesus looks at us and he really says, and he, he knows, I know what you really mean. He says, you want somebody to validate your worth. You really, feel a, want, you, you really want to feel a surge of life infused into all the death that you experience all around you. You really want the brokenness and pain that you feel to be mended. You want to experience deep peace when we label it as all of those surface level things. But Jesus says, I know you. I created you. I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. I know the deepest longings of your heart. And we have the opportunity to internally look and explore what, what we hunger for deep in our soul. And maybe a good place to start is by asking the question, what have you asked for repeatedly and maybe even received? You got it. But you were left still hungry. You constantly over and over again have pursued that next level or that next gift, or that next blessing, and each time you got it, it didn't take too long until you were asking again, what's next for me, Lord? Are we looking at those deeper longings and those deeper desires, and are we asking God to give us some insight to that? Because wouldn't it be a shame if our lack of reflection on our heart's desires and what, we're, what they are really pointing to if that lack of reflection would cause us to never really fully satisfy the desires of our heart. 
He ends that explanation that he can give us this bread. He says, because God has placed the seal of approval on him. He said that back in one of the other verses. 27, if you're paying attention. God set a seal of approval on him. And see, at this point, the people hear that, and you know what they're thinking about? Food. They're still thinking about food. Physical hunger, that they still haven't gotten it, and it doesn't seem like Jesus is going to deliver the same way he did last time. And so they ask a question in verse 29. Oh, no, I did this last time. He asked, they asked this question. They asked, how do we work this power? If you're not going to give it to me, let me get it for myself. If, God, if you can do it because God set a seal of, of approval on you, well, how do you work, do the works of God then? Let me just bypass you. I'll get, get it for myself. And Jesus answers patiently. In verse 29, he says, this is the work of God that you believe in the one whom he has sent. What's our job? It's to believe. Man, this doesn't sound like a transaction in the same way we had set it up to be. So here's our second key word. If our first key word was sign, if we're really going to understand what it means that Jesus is the bread of life, our second key word is believe. Jesus' job is to care for us. Our job is to believe in him. That's what this sign is pointing to and trying to unfold and unpack for the people that this isn't about just another transaction so that they can get what they wanted. This is about this intimate belief and connection. He's through with this whole exchange thing. Whether you see him, Jesus, talking about believing in him or coming to him, Jesus is trying to set our relationship with him right. For years, the religious system had convinced the people that their favor with the Lord was contingent on their works for him. I do all the good things. He gives me what I want. Does this sound familiar to some of you? Maybe we've kind of tricked ourselves into believing that it still existed that way. Be better, whatever that means to you, but be better than whatever you are right now. And maybe God will start giving you what you wanted. But that's not it at all. God was never looking for a staff of workers. He was looking for a family of worshipers. The proper order of our relationship with Jesus is one of dependence. Dependence. What does it mean to you to be dependent on Jesus? Like really, what does it mean to you to be dependent on Jesus? It means to see him as the only one who can satisfy our needs, those deep needs. And I believe that we are at a time in history that's a little bit different, where one of the biggest enemies of dependence is distraction. We're walking with Jesus and we feel like he's given us a purpose and a calling and we're walking toward it and the closer we get to where God wants us to be, the harder it gets. And the more, if we're going to keep going in this direction, all right, Jesus, you've got to come through because if you don't, things are, things are really going to fall through. Jesus, I'm depending on you. I'm depending on you. But we get to these places of discomfort and we're distracted. There's so many other things to be focused on, good things, things that seem very beneficial, and sometimes we're just so distracted. that we forget what we were even doing in the first place. When God says, "No, don't check out, lean in." Because it's going to be hard. It's going to be uncomfortable. You might get hurt along the way. You might come out with some battle scars. But please, please, please don't check out. We can do this if we are dependent. If you stay distracted, you stay stagnant.
We work like the finish line is pleasure and comfort when it's really fulfillment and satisfaction. Don't be distracted by pleasure and comfort. If we're really looking to pursue deep fulfillment and satisfaction, Jesus is inviting us to depend on him to find it. Well, after they miss the point yet again of Jesus' invitation to move into a deeper relationship with him, they show that they are still thinking about food. And I just kind of imagine Jesus like this. Like, how many times do I have to tell you that it's about belief and, and deep fulfillment and you're talking about food? And so they, they say, well, what sign are you going to do that we may see and believe in you? This is verse 30. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, there's also this implied thought, manna came every day, Jesus, Moses, Moses gave us manna every day. You did one, one time? Come on, if you expect us to follow you and believe in you, where's the, you know, it's day two. <laughs> 40 years in the desert. And Jesus said to them, trying to clear things up in verse 32, truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Wow. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's pretty pretty gutsy for Jesus to say, I've come down from heaven I've never heard anybody in my life say anything like that. And if they did, I might react the way that some of these people did. But there's that third key word we want to zero in on. Life. God sees our spiritual life as being of utmost importance. And he sends Jesus to bring us that life. See, life was the point all along. He tries to indicate to them that manna was a sign too. God was supplying manna to the people as a way of demonstrating that the people can depend on him for the very essential aspects of life. And the proper order of our relationship with Jesus is one of dependence. And we could depend on him for life itself, but not just physical life. Like he's got that. He showed us that he can do that. He's saying abundant life, eternal life, life to the full everlasting life. And I wonder if some of us here today are saying, yes, that's, now, now I, I'm putting it in the right categories. What I've been praying for isn't just another blessing. What I'm praying for is life itself to be infused into every area of my life here on earth because we want to live. They heard him say, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they say in verse 33, sir, give us this bread always. They still think he's talking about physical hunger and physical food. Jesus, I feel like, has tried to explain this. He's like, listen, people. I've said this a couple of times now, and you're not getting the message. I tried to be a little bit like creative or maybe poetic with it tried to, you know, ease you into it, but you're not getting it. So here it comes. Brace yourself. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He said, it's been about me the whole time, guys. Listen, it's been about me the whole time. The sign Believing life. And over the next couple of verses, what Jesus does is explains to him that he was talking about himself and that he's been sent by God from heaven to bring them a spiritual awakening toward an eternal life. One where they can live resting in the dependence of their God. And through this relationship of dependence and care, they can have, through Jesus, life. 
And it really gets down to this. If you're going to catch anything, I want you to catch this because this is what, what's really being communicated here. Everything that Jesus has ever done in your life has been with the intention to move you toward greater and greater dependence on him. He's saying everything that I've done in your life, every yes and every no, I've been looking to do one thing. I want you to be dependent on me. You thought it was a transaction when I was concerned about dependence. He purposefully moves and acts and gives and takes away and opens doors and closes doors and performs miracles and tells you no and tells you yes, all to move you toward greater dependence. And he is God so masterful at this that he can even use the broken and evil things in this world and the painful devastation that you've experienced, the brokenness, and those hard, the hardest of the hard times. And he can redeem it for his good purposes because his purpose is that you would become more and more dependent on him and he can take the brokenness of the fall and he can breathe life into it. That's why he can say, and we can say, what man meant for evil, God meant for good for you. And for me. And as we see God meet our physical needs, we're reminded that this is all a sign that directs us beyond a spiritual equation into a relationship of intimacy and trust in Christ, who longs to infuse us with life as we depend on him. And if what God is doing in your life right now at this moment does not move you toward greater dependence, you're missing the point. You have one job. You've got one job. Dependence. So Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Who comes, he who comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And that's what we're left with. And that's why Jesus' words of, of, of his, his own declaration about himself is so powerful. But there's, a, I guess, a lingering question is, what are you going to do about it? Because in the passage, we, three, we see three different responses to this. We have three different responses to, to Jesus' declaration of I am the bread of life. Over here, we have people respond who we'll call the haves. Then we have the have-nots. Then we've got the I only have Jesus. And there are three different groups that we see how they respond to Jesus in this. And in that, maybe we can place ourselves. So let's start out with the haves. Maybe you might see yourself as a person who's one of the haves. In the passage, it's the religious rulers, right? They had it all. They were in a position of power. They were in a position of self-sufficiency. Sufficiency. Whatever rules were already created, they capitalized them and, and sometimes even uh, arranged them for their own benefit so that they could keep their position of self-sufficiency, and I don't know if you would consider yourself a self-sufficient person, but you're the type of person who's like, when Jesus comes around and he says, depend on me, you're like, I got it. I'll see you on Sunday, but I got it. See, this type of person over here has been believing that all of these things that they've been working toward for this self-sufficiency is going to really satisfy them, and they've been tricking themselves into believing that maybe even the next thing is going to satisfy them, or their position will satisfy them, how other people see them will satisfy them, but here they are, standing in this place of self-sufficiency, hungry. They don't want to talk about that part, though. And what, is this, what does this group do? I guess before we talk about what they do, maybe for you, what would it look like if you were in that place and God called you to depend on him and he wants you to restructure your life? He wants you to give up some things. Maybe that thing that you've been depending on. He might be asking you to stop working so hard. Maybe downsize your house, take a lower salary, cut your spending, sacrifice your corporate ladder goals in order to reprioritize so that all of this, he can say, don't worry about all that. Depend on me. Spend time on the things that I say are important because all of this that you've been chasing after that you think will get you that feeling of fulfillment, 
I never promised it would give you fulfillment anyway. Why are you spending so much time focused on it in the first place? But he says, don't worry, you can depend on me. And you know what they did? In chapter seven, verse one, after this exchange, we hear what happened next. It says, after this, Jesus went about Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the religious leaders were seeking to kill him. The haves, they don't want any part of Jesus. They might even go as far as to kill him. Then you have the have-nots. This is the crowd. This is the group of people who know they need help. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's very apparent, I, mean, I need some help. But they got their fill. Jesus has come through for them. Maybe Jesus has come through for you. And when this group realizes their relationship with Jesus is just one of transaction where Jesus supplies them with a blessing and and they reply with more asks. And he starts saying maybe a little bit of hesitation in his answers. They're the ones that say, what must we do to be doing the good works of God? How can we start supplying our own needs? Because it was really only about the blessing in the first place. It was never about you, Jesus. You were just a means to an end. We just want to get our stomachs fed. It's more about the blessing than the blesser. It's more about the gift than the gift giver. Maybe you're one of these people in the have-nots group over here that Jesus is asking you to move toward greater and greater dependence on him in relationship, not just transaction. And it says in verse 66, after this, many of his followers turned back and no longer walked with him. If we continually approach Jesus like he's our own personal genie, when he starts doing things that we're not too keen on, we're just going to walk away. And then maybe maybe you're over here. The next exchange between Jesus and his 12 is is really powerful because it almost seems like Jesus is is a little bit vulnerable at this point because I'm... He's probably confident because he's Jesus and all, but, but he, he sees everybody leaving him or trying to kill him. And he turns to his 12 in, his, in verse 67. And he says, do you want to go away as well? Are you going to leave me too? Here's a chance. There's the door. Yes, amen. Walk. And then Peter, <laughs> the loud mouth spokesman of the Bible, speaks up for all 12 of them, and he says something actually that's really powerful. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Wow. That's, those are the words of somebody who says, you know what? They can have their promotions. They can have their stomachs filled. I can have Jesus. Because if you have all of that, but you don't have this, then you have nothing. And really, that's a place that offers freedom. Freedom from living up to everybody else's expectations. So that you can be your most authentic self, even though you're not the most impressive one in the room by their standards. But you are you. And Jesus loves you and he wants to draw you in so close into a relationship with him. And if you follow him and keep after the things that he has planned out for you, you won't have to worry about all that. So maybe here's our practical action step. Maybe anytime we begin or th- to say or think the phrase, I need, you know what I need? I need, you know, Dot, dot, dot. You know, fill it in the blank for you. You've said it a bunch of times. It's not, it's not a new statement for you. It's not a new statement for me. But maybe instead of filling it right in with the tangible, practical thing that you think you need, maybe we should just pause and just whisper something to ourselves. You know what I need? I need Jesus. Okay. We can still ask for the things. We can still pursue purpose. We can still pursue uh, the, what God has for us and having having tangible things be aspects of how he's fulfilling his purpose within us. But that's not what we're counting on anymore. Because a lot of times we'll say the things like, 
You know what I need? I need that promotion. I need a drink. I need that guy to text me back. I need to get out of bed. I need that contract to go through. I need to lose some weight. I need to see this woman one last time. I need to pass that test. I need to stand up to that bully. I need to speak up against injustice. See, some of these things are actually really good things that Jesus wants for us. And we we say, I need, maybe just before, before you say it, just come over here and do a check-in. You know what I need? I need Jesus. And it's in that place of confidence and of grounding that God has planned out a a wonderful relationship and a future with us. With us. With relationship. You know, we we have a, a last question. Is can we really depend on Jesus for everything? No, but okay. Thanks, church people. But can we really? No, but can we really? Everything? What if everything falls apart? What are we really left with? Maybe I'll just, I just gotta, gotta keep a couple of irons in the fire just in case this Jesus thing doesn't come through. I know I can depend on him for a great worship service and a shot of inspiration on Sunday, but what about everything else? You know, it made me think about this this story I want to tell you as I think back. So there I was. It snuck up on you, didn't it? So there I was. You know, it was a time in my life where I was, I really liked picking up hitchhikers. And I would pick up hitchhikers almost every other week. People who I saw walking on the side of the road. And I thought, man, I wonder where they're going. And so I'm driving down Route 29, and it's a nice day. It's pretty hot outside, and I see somebody walking on the side of the road, and I figure I have a good amount of time. You know, I'm not in a rush to wherever I'm going. So I I start to slow down, and I am thinking, and I realize that there is a disabled car not too far back. And so this person who's walking is probably walking from this car. So I feel a little bit safe-ish. And so I slow down, and I look out the window, you know, the passenger side as he's walking by, and I look, and it's this this older man who kind of looks like a Clint Eastwood lookalike. <laughs> Weathered face. You know, when I shake his hand eventually, he's this big leathery hand. and He gets in the car and he tells me that he ran out of gas. And, you know, this probably very self-sufficient older man is not too happy that this young punk kid is the one that comes in to save the day. But he gets in the car and I, you know, I'm asking him a lot of questions and probably a little bit too uh, eager you know, my personality, but he, with his one word answers, tells me, you know, he's looking for gas and I tell him I can go give him a ride to the gas station. And I realize I don't know where the gas stations are around there. But thankfully, not too far ahead, there's one of those blue signs on the side of the highway. You know those, right? Okay. All right. I at least know there's a gas station up here. And right about the time, I think it was probably the exact moment I saw the blue sign, I experienced this. I was driving, and then my car goes, puh, 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 puh. and I looked down, and I was out of gas. <laughs> and so I pull over onto the side of the road, into the the uh, the shoulder, and this man, the look on this guy's face. I mean, <laughs> and then we both have to get out of the car and then walk to the gas station together. But he was about 20 yards in front of me the whole time. He was not, we were not walking together. Let's just get that, let's just get that out of the way. But isn't that the case where, where a lot of times we, we see our salvation, we see the thing that's going to rescue us, and we, we think that's going to get us to a place of fulfillment, but, but, but the truth is, is that thing that we thought was going to fulfill us and get us to that spot of being fully satisfied It's running out of gas itself. And you know what they are because you have, like me, we have gone back to the same things time and time and time again. You, like me, are continuing to tell yourself, maybe just one more time, maybe just one more text, maybe just just one more drink, maybe just one more promotion, Maybe just one more, what is it? 
But the truth is, it's ran out of gas time and time again, but you keep getting into that car. Me too. But Jesus, he once and done satisfies our deepest need for salvation. That deepest core that drive inside of us. He says in verse 47, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, you will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus paid the ultimate price in order to bring you into a relationship with him. And if you're anything like me, then as you've been listening to this word and hearing Jesus talk about giving us fulfillment, you've got something in your mind, something that you've been relying on. And you've been saying maybe just one more time when Jesus is saying, come to me. And maybe today is a day where you just want to put a a stake in the ground, a declaration. That as Jesus declares something about himself, maybe you can respond not with, just with another question about where's my next meal coming from, where's my next blessing coming, coming from, but maybe you can make a declaration to say enough, I'm with you. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity. Those of you who have been following Christ for a while, those of you who, have, who are followers of Christ, maybe there's something that you're thinking of and you're reminded of the fact, you're reminded that Jesus is somebody who wants to be in relationship with me and, and it is this dependence that, that he really reaches out and offers me. You know what? I'm gonna give up something today. And I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet because it's a declaration. If that's you, if something's come to mind over the last couple of minutes, if something's come to mind to you that you want to say enough, I'm going to leave it here. And I'm with him. Maybe this is it for you. Enough. I'm hungry. I've been hungry for a while now thought the last thing was going to be it. All right, Jesus, let's go. Prove it. Because if you don't declare it, it's a lot easier to go back to it. And maybe you're in this room and you've never made a decision to follow Christ before. Maybe you're in this room and today is your first day of saying, you know what? I've been hungry in, a, in like my, my deepest part of my soul. And maybe you're standing today or maybe you want to stand today as a way of saying, this is my first chance. This is my first chance to really experience what it means to taste of Jesus. What a true meal actually is. And maybe you might want to stand to your feet. And I want to pray for you because this is a powerful sign. Jesus gives us signs to tell us something about himself, but wow, you're giving him a sign too. This is a movement with a message for him. And it's not missed. Well, let me pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being a God that doesn't give up on us. And however many times we might choose something over you, you are always willing to welcome us back with open arms. You are so patient with us. Patient beyond what our sins deserve. Thank you for continuing to reach out and offer us the bread of life, your very being. And that with you and in you and through you, we can be satisfied at the deepest core of our being. Lord, I pray for those that are standing, whether they are standing declaring a return to you or a first move toward you, that because of your death, burial, and resurrection, your power be, would be seen in their life today and your fulfillment and satisfaction would be felt. Father, I pray that you would bless their declaration and walk with them as their God. We pray all this in Christ's name.
Amen. Amen. And I'm going to have everybody stand up as I dismiss you. I'm going to ask the altar prayer team to come down. And if you would like prayer, it really, if you've made any decision, if you walk out of this place and you have not told anybody about what God is doing in your heart, then you're missing out on one of the best aspects of Bridgeway Community Church, this community of support among each other. And if you can't make your way down here for prayer, just raise your hand. The altar prayer team will come to you. All right? And if you want to check out more about what Bridgeway is all about, Pastor Dan will be back here for Bridgeway in five. Don't miss out on your chance to get connected. Well, let me pray. Lord, thank you for a morning, afternoon, day where we can come together and hear of your word and come before you and find out what you mean when you say, I am the bread of life. Thank you for fulfilling us, for satisfying us, for meeting our deepest needs in your son, Jesus Christ. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen, Bridgeway.